You've probably been wondering if we're ever going to finish Greek sculpture, and the answer is yes. At the end of this lecture, we'll be ready to move on to Greek architecture and then to Greek painting. Today, I'm going to talk about the Hellenistic Age, which is generally defined as the period from when Alexander the Great died in 323 BCE to when Cleopatra and Mark Antony, who were the last of the Ptolemaic line, which was actually the last of the Greek lines, uh, were defeated in 31 BCE, and this all became part of the Roman Empire. Uh, in the Hellenistic age, the big cultural centers were the centers of the Greek successor kingdoms. And these included Antioch in Syria, Alexandria in Egypt, Pergamon in Asia Minor. So I began my lectures on Greek art with a map of Greater Grecia, and now it's greater still. Alexander carried Greek Greek ideas and art all the way to Egypt, Persia, and even India, and not surprisingly, he brought back Near Eastern ideas and people as well. Let's just take a quick look. There you see the extent of Alexander's conquests, and then upon his death and the murder of his wife and son, uh, his empire was divided up among a number of his generals who would rule for different periods of time, but eventually would all end up giving way to Rome. So when Alexander's kingdom split into three parts, each ruled by a general, uh, these new cities would accumulate great wealth, and that in turn promoted art patronage. But it was a different kind of citizenship. Essentially, the one-time citizen of the polis was now cosmopolitan. And what does that mean? Um, politan, it doesn't just mean that you like magazines with sexy girls on the cover. Politan means citizen. You can hear the root polis in the word. What does cosmos mean? It means world. So a cosmopolitan is someone who views themselves as a citizen of the world, or really more accurately, of the larger Greek world in this case. Uh, let me give you a couple more words that should enter your art history vocabulary and your general vocabulary for that matter, although I don't think they actually appear in this chapter. Syncretism is what happens when you bring together or merge elements from many cultures. It's very often applied to religion. So Greek and then Roman religion, for example, became increasingly syncretistic in this period because it absorbed concepts, even gods, from the East. Uh, and in the next unit, we'll see that Buddhism actually picked up some artistic influences from the Greeks as well due to Alexander's uh, invasion. Oik oikumene, it's actually, it means household, which in Greek terms was the essential family and economic unit. Uh, it interested me when I was looking into this that this is the root word, I knew it was the root word of ecumenical, uh, which is the term we use to describe cooperative efforts by diverse churches. But also... Uh, the terms economy and ecology, which also deal with sort of household or social and environmental interactions. Um, but what this term is really referring to in Hellenistic, in the Hellenistic world, is the oikumene, the place that felt like home. The civilized world, again, was much broader. Um, the people with whom you empathized, the people you cared about, were not just the citizens of your polis, not just your fellow Athenians or Spartans or Corinthians. Uh, in the Hellenistic period, not only did people come to define Greek much more broadly, but they really gained a broader understanding of people from other cultures. Now, understanding didn't always mean that they liked them, uh, but you're living in a less narrow world. Uh, and Hellenistic art explored this feeling and understanding of others. So we'll start right out, oops, I didn't mean to skip over that, uh, with a piece of art that is not, I believe, in your book, although it is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, this is a very small, quite exquisite Greek bronze from this era. Uh, it's thought to portray a dancer, an Egyptian dancer, in Alexandria, Egypt, which is one of the cosmopolitan cities where Greek culture met and married Near Eastern culture. Uh, the subject appears to be exotic and foreign, and yet the statue exhibits many Greek artistic characteristics. So, so what are some of those characteristics? Well, you have the twisted figure with the chiastic counterbalance. Uh, you know, the outstretched leg balances the opposite outstretched arm, for example. You have the clothing, the drapery folds that 
both reveal and conceal her form. Look at her leg, for example, how clearly it's revealed, and yet the drapery is exquisitely rendered. You have that sense of movement, and even though it's veiled, you still have an expressive face. Uh, all of this identifies the veiled dancer as a work that's Greek rather than Egyptian in style. I mean, you know something about what Egyptian style looked like, and it carried on through the Greek period. Nevertheless, the subject matter of this helps capture this new, wider Greece. Uh, consider this statue also of a Gallic chieftain killing himself and his wife, basically to avoid being taken. He'd be killed anyway, probably she would be made a slave. Uh, this is shown from several directions. You're going to see a number of slides like this, even though I kind of dislike the busyness, because you really have to approach these statues from several directions to capture the full range of movement and narrative. These are fully in the round. They fully occupy open space around them. Uh, sculpture is no longer contained within the block of the rock, if you will. Uh, this work was originally placed on an altar in the Hellenistic city uh, in Asia Minor, Pergamon. Again, we'll come back to that uh, when we get on to architecture. Notice that these are sculptures of foreigners and that the sculpture does depict them as foreigners. They have these different, slightly wild hairstyles, different kinds of clothing. Uh, again, this is evidence of Hellenistic cosmopolitan culture, interest in the foreign foreigners, Art is no longer all about Greeks, but what I think is particularly interesting is that while defeated subjects, as you know, are not a new subject of art, I mean, you think of the beheaded heads, um, uh, bodies on the Palette of Narmer, or uh, the enemies falling off the mountain in the victory steel of Naram Sin, but have we before seen this kind of sympathetic treatment of the defeated? Again, I think this is evidence of the more empathetic expressionistic and passionate art of this period. Uh, there's also a certain amount of fascination with death and dying, particularly among the warriors. So here's another sculpture of a dying Gaul. Uh, and this time we think a trumpeter. The wild hair and the neck torque, you see the sort of rope necklace, uh, all that uh, were apparently all that the Gauls, who are also called the Celts or the Galatians, Galatians actually means Gauls, wore into battle according to tradi tradition. So this identifies him as a foreigner. And yet look at that athletic young body. It clearly conforms to Greek standards of physical beauty. Uh, the other is not, you know, depicted as beaten and puny. Uh, this is an admiring piece of work capturing a defeated uh, enemy. Uh, and his face likewise captures a universal physical passion and, for that matter, pain. Again, this emotional expressivism is the most important and most easily identified characteristic of Hellenistic art. You should be able to look at a Hellenistic sculpture you know, particularly, I mean, maybe it's hard, can be hard to tell it from, say, a late classical period sculpture, but it isn't hard to tell it from older Greek works. And on that point, uh, compare here the dying Gaul that I just showed you uh, with an archaic period dying warrior. This was found on the east pediment of the Temple of Aphaea in Greece. Uh, I know for one thing that this is, that the, that the lower uh, statue, the archaic statue, is really creepy example of the archaic smile. Uh, but what other differences do you see between the two figures? Well, I'd say that the Greek on the bottom is serene. I mean, he seems like he's almost content to die for his polis. You know, fitting in with the concept of public virtue, of ethos, his body is muscular and beautiful. It's not writhing in death agony. The dying Gaul, just 250 years later, is dying again in expressive agony. Which figure draws your sympathy? And I guess I'd follow up with the question, is the Greek warrior on the bottom meant to draw your sympathy or rather your admiration? Again, I think we're seeing art having a somewhat different purpose. This is really, to, to some extent, more art for art's sake, whereas the statue on the bottom is about the glorification of Greek warriors, honoring the gods. You know, it basically is fulfilling a different purpose. We're seeing a very important evolution in art. 
Okay, this is another must-know sculpture, but it's also one I think you're going to find easy to remember. Nike is Athena in her role as the goddess of victory. No, it's not just sneakers. Uh, and here she is landing on a stone that is carved to look like a Greek warship. The statue was out in the harbor. It was incredibly dramatic. When she still had an arm, it was holding out a wreath to crown the, the victor in the naval battle. Again, you see a lot of characteristics of Hellenistic art. Notice how the clothing reveals more than it disguises the body. If anything, it adds to the erotic impact of the piece, that this almost cellophane-like material is clinging to her and revealing her body underneath it. Likewise, this windswept clothing is just a masterpiece of delicate carving. Technical skills continue to improve. And the outflung body, it goes beyond that counterbalancing symmetry, the symmetria of classical sculpture. This is asymmetry, movement. You know, even the possibility that any moment she'll take flight. This is not a serene and still or even a particularly balanced sculpture, although it has its own rhythm and excitement. Uh, the statue also would have reflected light from the water, and that would have enhanced the sense of lightness and movement as well. So again, I feel like I'm repeating myself, sorry, but this is art as high emotional drama. But note, so that, you know, we don't mistake the function. This is also art in the service of the state and its glory. Hellenistic art is more individualistic. It may be more sympathetic to the foreigner, to the defeated. Uh, but the honor of the Greek kingdoms will still be celebrated in art. Uh, here's another opportunity to compare Hellenistic sculpture with earlier sculpture. These are both famous statues of Nike. You're actually going to encounter the one on the left when we turn to the Parthenon and the Acropolis. Um, but you haven't seen it yet. But you know it's 410 BCE. It's going to be high classical. What similarities and differences do you see between this and this Hellenistic uh, sculpture of the Nike of Samothrace, the winged victory. I mean, there are some very important similarities. There's the subject, of course, and there's the fact that both statues celebrate Greek victories. The uh, winged victory is later from the Hellenistic period, so it's kings uh, of that, uh, I believe it would have been the Seleucid Empire. Both statues portray drape drapery beautifully, although I actually find the winged victory somewhat more dramatic, certainly more revealing, although they're both somewhat revealing. They do this revealing and concealing trick, uh, so it's not new to Hellenistic art. Both of the statues convey movement, but the movement of the of the Nike adjusting your sandal is kind of a gentle, almost a friendly movement, whereas, you know, the, the winged victory seems like she is, in fact, about to take wing. It's more active. It's more vibrant. I guess the word I would be inclined to use is it is it's more theatrical. Think of Peter Pan swinging in on those wires. I mean, this was sculpture designed to have an impact, not unlike uh, a display in a Greek theater. Okay, well, do you remember uh, Praxiteles, Lysippos, and Scopus? I'm probably again pronouncing those wrong. Actually, in fairness, I didn't tell you about Scopus when I was talking about the major sculptors of the fourth century, and I should have. Uh, this middle sculpture is in your book, and again, this is late classical. Notice the more expressive figures, uh, the highly athletic muscular young man, the sad older man reflecting on the death of youth. Um, you also see a sculpture by Praxiteles that you didn't see before, another famous one, Apollo the Lizard Slayer. Again, a little ironic because this really isn't Apollo as the conquering god. Again, notice the more slender form that's typical of the fourth century, the late classical period. And then from Lysippos, you see arrows swinging a bow. Uh, cupids become much more popular in this period, more sentimental. There's more family focus. The children look more like children. Um, so again, these are three of the most famous 4th century Greek sculptures. Uh, and as I said, I should have included a work by Scopus before. But all three of these late classical sculptors paved the way for the more emotional, more spatially filled and dramatic, more twisted or contorted, and I would say more erotic art. And this trend would continue in the Hellenistic period. So it's just kind of a quick review of where we came before. 
you know, you might be in a situation where the AP would ask you to distinguish between late classical and Hellenistic. Uh, but my guess is most of the time they're going to give you a sharper contrast than that. But, you know, don't count on it. I could be wrong. Okay, this again is one of the most famous pieces of erotic art, or at least provocative art in world history, the Venus de Milo. Once again, I'm including multiple e images despite the busyness because you can only see the full power of this sculpture by viewing it from multiple directions. Note that it is larger than life and that the dress slipping down, you know, there's the question, will it slip off, is actually a tease that renders the statue even more provocative. Uh, here we see another famous bronze of the Hellenistic period. This is a seated boxer. So with this bronze, we return to the popular Greek theme of the magnificent athlete. But again, how is he different from earlier athletes or athletic young men that we've seen? He's battered and bruised. His nose and teeth are broken. Uh, there's inlaid copper blood that drips from cuts in his forehead, nose, and cheeks. To really get a feeling for this, let's compare him with the Riace warrior. Remember that those were sculptures that were uh, found from a shipwreck? Uh, the Riace warrior, 450 BCE, you know, right in the heart of the classical period. Uh, they're superficially similar, highly muscled. They use the bronze, although notice that in addition to seeing the muscle on the seated boxer, you also see a few folds of fat. Perhaps he's aging, perhaps his skin is not as firm as it once was. Not quite the same perfection you see in the Riachi warrior, but a much, much more expressive face. I just think the emotional impact of the, these true works is greater. And also, this is Greek art that is not only celebrating the immediately successful hero. And in that spirit, this is really an exquisite sculpture. But this old market woman almost seems like a parody. I don't think it's really intended to be, but of those beautiful women with their drapery slipping off their body. It's slipping off her body, too. You don't necessarily want it to go any further. But again, it's used to conceal and reveal, and it's beautifully sculpted. Uh, but this is, again, not a heroic figure. The sculptor is very forthright about her age, her infirmity, the difficulties of her life, her aches and pains and struggles. This is a world that wants to see its world portrayed realistically, but artistically in its sculptures. Okay, I mentioned this in class. Uh, this one is very famous, and really, of all the sculptures I've shown you, it seems to be the one that has most frequently appeared on the AP test, which doesn't mean it will appear in yours. But with this sculpture, we come to the end of Roman Greece. Uh, this work is actually from the first early first century CE. We haven't seen those initials for a while, so this is after zero, after the birth of Christ. And it was unearthed in Rome in 1506, and by the way, Michelangelo was looking on as, as it was unearthed, and it's considered to be a statue that, have, that influenced him quite a bit. That's a very common AP question. We're not to Michelangelo yet, but I might as well tell you that. Uh, it was found in the remains of the palace of the Roman Emperor Titus. The original, according to the Roman historian Pliny, was attributed to, and I really am going to probably butcher these names, Athenodorus, Hegesandros, and Polydorus of Rhodes. Uh, if you get this on a multiple choice test, and I have seen it on a multiple choice test, I would I would recommend as you remember the Rhodes part, uh, and you'll probably get it. Uh, Lacon was a Trojan priest uh, who saw through the ruse of the Trojan horse when it was offered by the Greeks, and the gods who sided with the Greeks sent sea serpents to strangle him. Now, when we get to Rome, we may note that the Romans uh, considered their civilization to have descended. Well, from Romulus and Remus uh, and Troy. And so the, tr the, the Trojans were actually their heroes. And so this is a hero being destroyed by the Greek gods, who actually seem pretty much like the Roman gods. Uh, at any rate, the Trojans, when, when Poseidon sends sea serpents to strangle Lacon and his sons, the Trojans interpret this as the gods punishing him for lying. I mean, he's a priest, you know, and if the gods are after him, he must be wrong. So they let the horse into the city, and I trust you know the rest of the story.
But again, this is Hellenistic art at its apogee, at its height. You see the incredible expressive emotion. These, these people are dying in pain. You see the twisted figures, the elaborate, but you know, both symmetrical and asymmetrical. Again, you have this counterpoise, the chiastic balance, the contraposta. Notice the, the bent knee uh, balancing with the bent elbows. Um, you see a dramatic view from every side. I haven't put as many in because I didn't want to take away from the power of this sculpture. So, whew, we made it. Uh, we are, however, I must warn you, going to encounter still more sculpture as we move on to architecture and architectural ornamentation.